the HTTP host header attacks. Now, this is the start of a new series uh, going through the Port Swigger Web Academy. I think it'll be very relevant to uh, pen testing, of course, obviously, because, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg here as far as what they cover. There's more labs and links within these links here. Uh, so there's a lot of... Uh, web app pen testing stuff that we can learn. And I'm sure even as a web app pen tester, there's a lot that I could even learn and even refresh my memory on some of these things as well. So I think this will be relevant for all skill levels, no matter where you're at. So yeah, without further ado, we'll get right into it. What's up? This is Ryan from Elevate Cyber. Like I said, we'll be covering HTTP host header attacks in this video. Now, let's just start with this diagram first. I think it does an excellent job at explaining what this is and how this works. Now, say you're accessing a web server that, uh, you know, it's, it's on a single server. It's hosting, uh, say, a public app and an internal app. You don't want to do this, as we'll see uh, in a bit as far as why, but you would typically have something like a reverse proxy sitting at the uh, DMZ here, you know, the firewall and all that. It does the firewalling and everything and it will route based on the host header, typically, uh, to the public app or the internal app. Now, the reason you don't want to do this is if the validation isn't being done properly, and you know you could open yourself up to uh, a malicious user being able to pass the internet app, the internal app, into the host header, and then it gets routed to the internal app that they shouldn't even have access to, right? Here is your good guy user here, just uh, accessing the public app as expected. So, I mean, that's basically what you have for host header attacks. You're basically manipulating the host header. So you could do it in this manner if they uh, if they make the mistake of hosting them both on the same server. There's also the host header injection attack um, where you're basically injecting into the host header uh, your payload that gets run as code, basically, right? And... Uh, Especially if the web server is uti utilizing the uh, the host header in, uh, to make a certain request or something, maybe something like this. That is what opens it up to injection, especially if they're not properly sanitizing and validating. You know, a common common problem there, right? Across the board. Because, you know, as a developer, you got to understand the host header is user controllable, right? It might not appear that way, but... If you've ever used Burp or any kind of proxy tooling before, you'll see that it's very trivial to manipulate something like any header, including the host header. So they can't, they have to assume that it's, um, you got to assume the worst, right? They got to validate against that. But most of the time, they don't even have to worry about that because a lot of this stuff will not use the host header. And that is how you protect against this vulnerability is number one thing is, don't even support, um, or, or not don't support it, but don't, because you have to have a host header, but rather you, you don't, you want to make sure that you're not, uh, using it to build out any requests, most certainly like this. Now you could have the server name instead in a configuration file, like uh, IIS has web.config. You could probably put it in there or any configuration file, depending on what uh, web server you're using, obviously. And instead of taking the server, the host name from the host header, take it from that configuration file because that will stay static. It won't be changed. It's not user controllable. So, well, hopefully, right? <laughs> hopefully the hacker didn't find a way to control that. But yeah, it's, it's a lot more stable than using something that is completely easily manipulated by the user. So... That is one, that's probably the best way to prevent against it is don't even rely on it in the first place. You know, but there are some other ways and we talked about this, right? The um, configuration file trick here. Another thing is to validate the host header, like I was saying. Now, it is important to note that some frameworks provide things like the allowed host options in the settings file. Um, they'll do it for you. You can, white, you can create your whitelist from there. So if you, if you absolutely must use it, check against the whitelist. You know, better to do that than a blacklist, most certainly. Don't support uh, override headers. I think this is an important point because there are some third-party uh, applications, or I don't know what you want to call them yet, third-party tooling you can pull in that will actually override your host, and perhaps that is um, controllable. So you want to make sure that you don't support that because you could be introducing vulnerabilities that you don't expect. Now, 
you know, whitelisted permitted domains, be careful with internal only virtual hosts, right? Because you don't want it the same server, like I said. But another thing that I found to be really uh, interesting information, we'll see if I can find it here real quick, is that, let me scroll up to the top here. This one is all about identifying and exploiting the vulnerabilities, which is definitely good information. You first want to start by supplying an arbitrary host header. So there's different ways to, uh, to do that, right? Um, so you can check for flawed validation, of course. And here's some really clever examples. If you remember back from the video that I created, the Python one actually, on where we're trying to check against the user agent. I showed how you can create some kind of validation on your server by using regular expressions. Well, the same thing here could be used on the server side to check against a host. So you could actually trick that filter depending on how good the regular expression is. And just to highlight this, they say one common way these rules are implemented is often by matching URL prefixes, suffixes, or using regular expressions. So pretty much just like that video. Go ahead and watch that video if you haven't seen it already. Uh, it's uh, one of the most recent ones I came out with. I'll try to link that in the description below um, if you want to see exactly how I implemented that. Not the most secure way, but hey, sometimes that's what you deal with as an attacker. You see these things that are not implemented in the most secure way. So if, say, it's just checking for the presence of the site name somewhere in the host header, and it's not really checking against the port, making sure this value here is numeric, you might be able to inject into the port your malicious payload, right? Another thing is maybe it's only checking for the presence of the website name in the host header, and, and that's it. So maybe you can add some additional stuff before or after, right? And maybe you have already controlled and compromised a subdomain, right? Then you can use that subdomain perhaps. So then the next thing you want to do is send, send ambiguous requests, right? Um, you can try adding in a second host header as well. There's a number of things you can do that a lot of the stuff is good information for me because I don't even think to do all this stuff a lot of times. I apologize for the smaller screen before. Hopefully this helps a little bit. I know we're like halfway through the video at this point, but um, yeah, you can add line wrapping even. So there's all kinds of techniques. This is why the Port Swigger Web Academy is so thorough with, uh, with their teaching here. We're only halfway through this article, right? And they give you some other techniques. So you can do request smuggling, which is another section that we'll be covering in a future video. Um, there's even the, the override header here, X forwarded host. So if you do see this header, definitely try to inject your payload into there because you might be able to override this host header here. And now I'm not going to get into the labs in this video, but we will be getting into the labs. There's a number of them and, uh, some of them pertain to slightly different vulnerabilities as well that we'll be getting to pretty much all of these at some point. Um, but yeah, I'm going to get into the really hands-on stuff in the next video in this series. So we're going to be playing around with the labs because that's what's awesome about this platform. Not only do they give you all the information, they also give you a number of labs to go out and get hands-on with the stuff, which if you know anything about me, I really highly value that as a way of learning. So we will definitely be doing that. Don't worry. So password reset poisoning is one thing you can do with this, which is very interesting. We're going to be jumping into that web cache poisoning via the host header as well. So um, I'm going to dive into the labs, these labs here in the next few videos. But this was just an overview of what is going on with this host header injection. And uh, basically when you see stuff like this, right, the way that you can have multiple different servers on the same server, I probably should have said this at the beginning, but you can do it by uh, using virtual hosting or routing traffic via an intermediary. So in the case of virtual hosting, basically it looks like to the end user, it looks like they're two separate servers, but in fact, they might be on the same IP address, right on the same physical server. And uh, they're basically hosted in a way known as um, virtual host, right? So they're basically routing it based off of a lot of times the host header, right? And if they're not properly using the safeguards we mentioned, then it could be vulnerable. 
And you might be able to get to other sites on that physical server uh, if you know what they're called, right? As we see here visually in this example, just changing the host header to the internal app and then, he, and then she's able to get there, right? And if it's done through an intermediary, I mean, it's a similar scenario, right? So you might actually have servers that are on, or websites that are on different backend servers, but all the traffic is sent through this intermediary system. So maybe like a load balancer, reverse proxy server or whatever. And, and that's what we actually see in this example here. Um, but in that case, um, they're gonna use like domain names to resolve the single IP address. So maybe they're not pulling those names from the, uh, from a configuration file. So maybe they're using the host header and trusting the input there. And maybe you can uh, inject into there to, uh, you know, pull off an injection vulnerability. So um, that that is a uh, potential vector there as well. So that's pretty much all I had for this video. Hopefully it helped you. Let me know if there's any questions down in the section below. And also keep in mind that in the future videos, I will be getting hands-on with the lab. So if you're more of a, I need to see it in action type of person, it will, that, those videos will probably answer a lot of the questions that you have as well. So yeah, thanks for watching. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the like button as well. And I will see you guys right over in the Python videos. If you want to see what I was talking about with the regular expressions and all that stuff and get caught up on uh, some of that content, then I'll see you right over there. Thanks for watching.